Hello, everyone. I'm Lori Beckman, Senior Editor for Production Machining Magazine. Welcome to another Parts Cleaning Spark session. Today's session, titled Ultrasonic Cleaning Beyond Cavitation and Implosion, is sponsored by Blackstone Nay Ultrasonics, a division of Cleaning Technologies Group. Thanks for joining us. Today you will learn about considerations for the optimal deployment of ultrasonics in cleaning processes, including the importance of tank and chamber design, transducer configuration and placement, ultrasonic power and ultrasonic frequency. Cleaning time, temperature and chemistry selection are reviewed, as well as transducer placement and ultrasonic frequency selection and their effects on cleaning performance. The science behind advanced system configurations will be presented, as well as concepts in megasonic equipment and process design. Our presenters are John Fuchs, Technology Specialist, and Josh Kramlick, Director of Global Sales, both from Blackstone Nay Ultrasonics. Today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. It's easy to submit questions. Simply type your question into the chat pane on your screen and we'll do our best to get to all of them. If you are not able to see the chat function, click on the full screen video icon at the bottom right of your screen, then exit full screen to see if that fixes the problem. Today's session, along with other Spark sessions, will be recorded and will be available on demand through the Spark platform later for you to view at your leisure. Now let's get started. Welcome, John and Josh. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Lori. Um, thank you to IMTS Spark for organizing the presentation sessions. Um, my name is Josh. I'm the director of global sales. I'm here with John Fuchs, who's our uh, technology specialist at Blackstone Nay Ultrasonics. Uh, we would like to quickly introduce a little bit about the cleaning technologies group. Um, Blackstone Nay actually is the ultrasonic technology group within the cleaning technologies group. We supply ultrasonic components and equipment to both our sister company, Ransohoff in Cincinnati, Ohio, and to our sister company, CTG Asia in Suzhou, China. Um, Ransohoff is, is highly involved in the automotive industry and heavy duty cleaning applications, industrial, um, and our, our sister, operation in China um, really supports a lot of automotive business and other opportunities in electronics and semiconductor cleaning in Asia. Uh, I will now turn it over to John who will <coughs> go through some of the background physics of uh, ultrasonics before we get into the applications. First off, uh, we said beyond cavitation and implosion, but there are a lot of people who don't understand that part. So those of you who do understand cavitation and implosion uh, can take a little nap and we'll just refresh uh, for those who haven't already seen it, what it's all about. I used to do this with slinkies, but we're going to do it with graphics today. Um, this is just a classic example of how a sound wave travels uh, through a media. What happens is the first molecule moves, pushes a spring, which is basically an, uh, an electronic or uh, interactive force with another molecule, and that pushes the next one, which pushes the next one. Meanwhile, uh, the first one is retracting as the sound wave vibrates from one part to another. And this creates areas called compression and rarefaction. Compression is where the uh, springs, if you will, are squeezed together, and rarefaction is where they're pulled apart. Um, as the wave travels, it's important to notice that the actual molecules or atoms don't go any further than just back and forth a little bit to transmit the wave. They stay where they are, uh, except for that small vibration. So one atom at the beginning doesn't end up at the end. It's just a sound wave that ends up at the end. Okay, we're going to talk about three concepts that are important to our in-depth discussion of ultrasonic cleaning now, those are amplitude or ultrasonic power, ultrasonic frequency, and process, because the process is just as important in many cases as the ultrasonic portion uh, of the equation is. Um, <clears throat> amplitude is the loudness. How loud is something? Uh, on the little diagram there, we have it. Uh, shown as, as a sine wave, and we're all probably familiar with the sine wave and its amplitude. 
And you can see that uh, in the B line, you're seeing double the amplitude of the A. So that means actually that the molecules are moving further to transmit the sound and that the sound is louder. The amplitude of a sound is determined by the intensity of the compression and rarefaction cycles in the sound wave. The illustration here shows how amplitude is represented with an XY or a density plot. Later on, we're going to use a density plot uh, because it's a lot easier to show some things with that rather than uh, by using uh, lines on the chart. Amplitude and ultrasonic power may or may not be the same thing. This is something a lot of people don't really understand. Um, ultrasonic power control is accomplished in many different ways. Uh, here are three of them, and I, I must say there are probably another 30 or so that we're not going to talk about. But amplitude can be truly turning down the amount of motion uh, that you see in the molecules. Um, in that case, as we see under the B under reduced power, your sine wave has gotten smaller. Your sound wave has gotten smaller. Another way of controlling power is to control it by time proportioning. And in this case, you actually turn the power on for a certain particular period of time. In this example, it's on for about half the time. And during the red cycle there, the power is off. And we turn it back on, we turn it back off. Now this <clears throat> essentially has reduced the power by 50%. But when it's on, it's full on. And when it's off, it's full off. So this is not really much different than changing the amount of time that you expose um, the part to the cleaning system. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a little hoarse today. Um, then there's a clipping, and this is sort of a combination of the two. And this is where you let the uh, sine wave go up to a certain point, and then you clip it off so it doesn't go on to the rest. Uh, this is truly reducing the volume, if you will, or the motion of the sound wave. It's just a little way of a little different way of doing it, and technically a little easier way to do it uh, than by actually uh, reducing the true amplitude. We would just highlight that amplitude power control is is very frequently uh, applied in ultrasonic welding systems where you have uh, power applied over a very short cycle. Um, traditional ultrasonic cleaning systems typically employ a time proportioning protocol, um, but actually some of our newest technology also uses amplitude power control in the cleaning cycle. Okay, and the other thing is frequency, and that's the number of cycles per unit of time, usually expressed uh, in hertz, and hertz replaced cycles per second many years ago, uh, for those of you who are as old as I am. Um, and in the example on the right, uh, the top one shows a particular frequency. You're seeing one cycle there, uh, and so, but since speed, the speed of sound remains the same, and you're trying to move twice as many times, in the lower example, you're getting two cycles in the same period of time. That's double the frequency or double the tone. Tone is like the, uh, the note on the piano. How high does it sound? How low does it sound? One thing I'd point out throughout the presentation, you'll see um, the little professor uh, emoji in the bottom, and those are links to um, purely technical discussions on our website, uh, John's technical blog. Well, John's technical blog and some of them are others, others but uh, they're, they're good references and things that we just really, they bring out things that we just really don't have time to talk about today. So if we wonder how cavitation happens, the little green bar over there is our vibrating source. It could be a speaker, it could be a transducer, could be a tuning fork, it could be anything. But as you'll see, the first particle or molecule is, is actually touching that source. And instead of springs now, we're going to use those little zigzag things because they're a heck of a lot easier to draw. And as you see in the second line down, we've started to vibrate the green sound source. And we've got the same kind of thing that we saw in the spring diagram in the beginning. 
with the compression and the rarefaction and the compression and the rarefaction. If we increase the amplitude even further, as shown on the bottom line, now we've gotten to the point where we've exceeded the cohesive strength of the liquid. Think of it as tensile strength uh, or cohesive strength. It, it doesn't really make any difference which one you talk about. Some people understand one and some people understand the other. But the whole idea of this thing is that the tension in the rarefaction is so high that literally those two molecules separate. They, the, the bond between them is broken and we form a cavitation void. That's the beginning of what cavitation is all about. That's where we start. And one other point to highlight here, um, in our terminology at Blackstone Nay, we, we try to emphasize that the use of the term void as opposed to bubble, um, which is very common in ultrasonic literature. Um, we do so to make the distinction between um, voids and gas bubbles that are a result of out, um, degassing of the liquid. Okay. In the previous slide, we showed something called transient cavitation. That is where we truly break the bond. There is also something called stable cavitation, and stable cavitation simply oscillates. The void grows and contracts and grows and contracts as rarefactions and compressions pass. In the case of transient cavitation, the cavitation void grows to a critical size and then collapses into itself in a catastrophic implosion. And we'll look at that in the next video here. This is a cavitation bubble or void being formed. As you can see, it grows larger and larger and larger. Now, the constrained surface in this illustration is at the bottom. That's where the bottom of the tank is. The top is actually the liquid surface. As the void starts to contract, you can see that jet that starts to form in the middle. As that goes down, it eventually penetrates the bottom of the void and actually passes through it, as we see here. And that whole void collapses and is aimed toward the constrained surface, which is the part that we're trying to clean. That's, that's pretty dramatic how that actually happens there. We're going to run it through again uh, so you can see the whole thing happen. Uh, actually, it's at 3750 frames per, per second, but um, here it is. And that's what makes ultrasonic cleaning work. The implosion of a cavitation void produces a high temperature jetting effect. You saw the jet. And... Uh, the numbers are, are astounding. Locally, we have as much as 5,000 degrees centigrade <clears throat> and 500 bar, or for those of you who are left-handed, 7,000 PSI. Uh, these are conditions very similar to those that are seen on the surface of the sun, for example. Um, don't get scared. They're very, very, very small. As a matter of fact, to my knowledge, neither one of these uh, numbers has actually been verified other than by calculation. It's never really, really been measured, but we know it's there. This was still you. Yeah. Did we, did we go the right way? Yeah. Okay. All right. So. I'm sorry. My mistake. Stable cavitation. We talked about that. That's just the uh, bubble growing and growing and getting smaller and growing and getting smaller. This is the mode of cavitation that does stirring. And this is what we use, or is the primary mechanism, when you're trying to remove uh, something using a solvent. Some liquid, for example, if you have oil on the part and you want to remove it and you're using uh, some water with detergent in it. Uh, stable cavitation, not singularly, but as part of that, uh, actually does a little stirring it can get inside blind holes and, and things like that. Transient cavitation is more useful in removing particles. Uh, not to say that it doesn't stir as well, but transient cavitation has that extreme burst of energy uh, that's required to displace particles that are adhered to surfaces. So the both, both of them work together. 
um, and each of them does its own thing and a little bit of the other one as well. But there are two kinds. And we talked about the stable cavitation, really the stirring comes from sort of the pulsing behavior of these oscillating voids. Um, and one thing that John and I talk about frequently is that the blind hole cleaning, what really becomes critical there is the wetting of those surfaces, but also the liquid exchange that you need for effective cleaning. Right. Um, Megasonics is a is an important field for us. Uh, we sell a lot of equipment in Megasonics for the semiconductor industry and optical applications. And in Megasonics, there's a relatively different um, set of behaviors that are contributing to the cleaning process. Uh, typically, we're talking about streaming. So at a frequency um, somewhere north of 150 kilohertz. Um, Often it's thought of in the range of megasonic and one megahertz, um, but we can actually demonstrate this at much lower frequencies. Um, the transient cavitation gives way to a combination of stable cavitation and bulk fluid streaming, uh, which is often referred to as Eckert streaming, where we actually have a kinetic energy um, transferring from the transducer face into the liquid bath. And this contributes to uh, rinsing and flushing in the cleaning process while it's operating in parallel with the stable and transient cavitation. This can be seen if you take a, um, for example, 170 kilohertz liquid bath and you introduce a colorant into that bath, you will actually see um, the flow away from the transducer face perpendicular to the transducer surface. And here's a, a video that John has found, um, which shows that pretty clearly. I believe here this is glycerin. Glycerin and water, yeah. Okay. So we have the glycerin at the transducer face, um, an 800 kilohertz megasonic transducer. This and is slow motion, too. Which is separate from the cavitation behavior. Um, that's pushing away from the transducer face. Um, the streaming at megasonic frequencies, again, we believe the stable cavitation remains present and plays an important part of the cleaning in those arenas. Um, transient cavitation, we believe, is much less important as we move into megasonic frequencies. Simply because the bubble can't grow large enough. With the higher frequencies, we don't have physically enough time for the bubble to propagate to a critical size. Um, megasonic cleaning like this is actually employed very frequently in semiconductor applications like wafer cleaning, where the, where the size of um, the pitch, for example, is seven to 14 nanometers, and the customers are very concerned about cleaning that. However, verifying particle cleanliness in that size range requires very special methods like um, we talked about the haze test. Which haze test, yeah which is not something that's available to most um, manufacturing companies. Okay, so everybody that took the, took the nap because they knew the part about cavitation can wake up now because we're gonna get into some real good stuff. Uh, from now on, let's consider how we take the basics of ultrasonics and make it do some work for us. It doesn't, however, work all by itself. We have to think about some other things as well. Um, these are common questions that we answer every day. What about tank size and shape, baskets, fixtures, transducer placement, frequency, power, process? Like I said, ultrasonics does not work by itself. It needs these other things to be considered in order <coughs> for it to be effective. First, let's talk about tank size all together an important subject because nobody wants to build a bigger tank than they have to. Well, it's not a good idea to skimp. We normally think of sound waves traveling away from the ultrasonic source, one wave behind the other. Although this phenomenon can be demonstrated, especially in a tank with no parts present, there are also echoes and reflections within the liquid in a tank that are beneficial to cleaning. Now, this is a this is an important point. Most ultrasonic 
tank testing is done without any parts in the tank. However, when you put parts in, everything changes. What you want is for the liquid to be saturated with cavitation voids. To allow this distribution of cavitation voids, there must be some free space around the parts being cleaned. In the upper picture, we see the, the sound waves going up in columns, as we've talked about before, as in straight waves. But also, we're seeing all of these reflections uh, that are actually getting to each side of the part, for example. Um, in the bottom one, we've got a much larger part in the small tank. And we can see that these reflections die out rather quickly. And it is possible that the ultrasonic wave never truly reaches the top of the liquid. You can see it diminishing there as it goes up. This is not a law, but for best results, I've seen that you should not occupy more than about 40% of the tank uh, with parts being cleaned. Uh, leave some room for that, uh, for that cavitation um, and for those reflections to take place. Or alternately, we might need to consider different ultrasonic configurations. Which right. We'll talk you about could put more. transducers on the side or even on the top in some cases. How big? Well, ultrasonic cleaning tanks, a few cubic inches in size, have been made. As uh, a matter of fact, there was a company that made a, a one for home use at one point for cleaning rings and uh, dentures, I believe. I'm not sure about the dentures. But, <laughs> but tanks of up to several several thousand gallons are not unusual. Uh, something the size of an Olympic swimming pool, in fact, is well within the reach of current technology. And that's. I wonder what that would feel like, swimming in that pool. Uh, at Blackstone, we actually, in the last two years, we've delivered quite a few uh, very large tank systems in the realm of 10,000 gallons um, with very high density of ultrasonic power in those situations. Um, a very good example of that is in the um, oil and gas industry. There's a requirement for heat exchanger cleaning, and those can be very large tanks with very heavy um, contamination and buildup, um, and those are, are typically are often now cleaned in, in ultrasonic cleaning systems. Um, as in all cases, there are exceptions to the rule. We can never avoid those. For example, when cleaning small parts in a single layer basket, a shallow tank may perform as well or better than a larger one. Layering point parts should be avoided as if possible. For example, if you have a bunch of little parts that are two inches high and you've got them spread out all over the of a tank and we would we would suggest that you do them in a single layer for other reasons that uh, we may not talk about later but uh, if you just dump them all in there together they're probably not going to clean anyway but if you have them all arranged nicely in a layer then why build a tank 20 inches deep when all you need is one that's five inches deep uh, so in that case we would go to a much more shallow tank also there are cases where a tall tank would be a benefit for example, in a plating operation, uh, plating tanks can be 10, 12, probably even more deep, but they're only a foot or two wide. So it's impossible to get even distribution of ultrasonic energy uh, by putting transducers just at the bottom of the tank. Then in that case, we put transducers dispersed along the sides of the tank and, uh, and get the result that we need that way instead of putting them on the bottom. Uh, another application that we frequently have um, in ultrasonic tank design, uh, very commonly, especially within the semiconductor industry, we have customers that are doing, um, using very aggressive chemistries. Uh, also in the optical industry, sometimes things such as hydrofluoric solutions. And in those cases um, where we can't use that chemistry directly in a stainless steel bath, we will use what's called a double boiler configuration. Um, in these applications, um, we'll show you on the next slide, there's, there's some geometry that has to be considered in that, um, but also important that we need to make sure that we have enough sort of surplus power density in the outer boiler tank to make sure that we can transmit effectively into the inner boiler tank. So in this double boiler configuration, this actually looks very similar to what John utilizes daily 
in our um, cleanliness testing and trials that we conduct here in our laboratory, where we'll basically just hold beakers of solution in a larger ultrasonic tank. One Don't the, get scared by this because we're not talking about orders of magnitude difference. There's a lot of math here. And by the way, for the overachievers, the wavelength at 40 kilohertz is about 1.56 inches. So what John was pointing out is that what we're when we design an application for a double boiler, there are these geometric considerations that need to be taken into account where you're looking at considering um, the multiple wavelength separation between the inner boiler and the outer boiler tank to make sure that we're getting good energy transmission and um, also in the design of the inner boiler to make sure that we're not uh, trapping air underneath it so that we're um, not coupling the liquid to the inner boiler tank. In this example, um, we're actually showing what would be more akin to a production application of a PVDF or a polypropylene inner boiler tank um, in a stainless steel ultrasonic bath. You can see that the bottom of this tank is sloped to make sure that we're not air trapping. Um, and you also see a much thicker bottom here on the inner boiler. That's because when using something like PVDF um, or polypropylene, we actually have a much um, a lower, lower speed of sound yeah. and therefore a longer wavelength. Um, so that changes the calculation of those geometries. Often we'll do these kind of applications with a quartz inner tank, which because of its, um, it has uh, speed of sound properties similar to steel. So we can tend to use a pretty thin tank like three millimeters for those. But again, not to get too hung up on the math here, but just to recognize that if you are designing an application using ultrasound for a difficult chemistry, um, we'd want you to come and speak to the ultrasonic guys to make sure that we're designing the system. Yeah, in right a production way. system, it can make a huge difference. One further point here is we wouldn't recommend these applications with megasonics because the megasonic systems um, can be very sensitive to reflection and interference. Okay, let's talk about baskets and fixtures. That's another one, another big one that we get questions about. Uh, and sometimes we wish we'd get more questions about because people make some serious mistakes uh, in designing their baskets and fixtures. Remember, that basket or fixture that you put your parts in to clean also becomes part of the cleaning load, which means that you have to consider that as part of what you're going to clean. Whether you're cleaning off uh, dirt that got on the bottom of it from... Uh, from putting it on the workbench or whatever, uh, you're cleaning both, not only the parts, but the parts and the fixtures. Beneficial features of fixtures are they should be lightweight. The lighter the weight, the less load you have on the ultrasonic system. There should be an open design. There should be an easy flow of liquid through that basket or fixture and around the parts because that also is beneficial to cleaning. Um, Flow of liquid around parts being ultrasonic cleaned is, is critical uh, to remove those contaminants that have been uh, loosened by the ultrasonics. Uh, we like to avoid plastic, rubber, and other soft materials uh, because they absorb ultrasonic energy. Uh, chemical resistant coatings uh, on stainless steel are preferred. Uh, something that uh, is, is thin and hard because ultrasonics will also take it off. Um, we avoid plastisol. Uh, it's basically a rubber. It, it soaks up energy like gangbusters. Um, and you should also think about minimum carryover potential because when you're uh, running tanks or running fixtures from one tank to another, you want to minimize how much of the cleaner, for example, that you take over into the uh, to the rinse. If you make the parts, if you make the baskets or fixtures out of uh, tubular stainless steel, for example, uh, they can carry a heck of a lot of liquid from one tank to another. Okay, transducer placement. Bottom placement is usually preferred, and the reason is because the liquid surface above provides a good reflecting surface for the distribution of sound waves, just like we saw in the uh, earlier pictures. Exceptions would include the following. Tall tanks, we said put them on the side. Massive, multi-side critical parts where you've got maybe a 600-pound part 
that you need to clean and it's got to be clean on all sides. You might put transducers on the, on even on all, all four sides and the bottom and maybe even the top. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a call as to how you're going to get that large a part actually ultrasonic clean. High intensity applications where the tank bottom alone does not allow enough space for the number of transducers. That's certainly what our multi-sided sided critical part was. And then there are also near field applications and these are where parts are positioned between two opposing transducers and uh, we'll discuss that in a little bit. Some applications require extremely high ultrasonic intensity. These include wire and strip cleaning, for example. In these applications, ultrasonic transducers are configured to utilize transducer proximity, in other words, just being close to the transducer. And in extreme cases, we use constructive sound wave interference to create the required ultrasonic intensity. These are near field applications. Let's take a look at how this uh, works a little bit. Next slide. In the example where these are required for applications like wire and strip, it's because of the very high processing speeds. Very high processing speeds. And wire and strip are, are good for it because uh, they're not huge parts. It's very difficult to employ this technique on large parts because the sound reinforcement areas, the highly concentrated areas, are relatively small. Let's just take a look, a look here. In a cleaning tank, uh, the level of liquid in the tank makes a difference. In this case, for example, if we had a typical part on the left uh, side of the, of the screen here um, and we wanted to clean it, we would put it in that white zone and that's the pressure node of the reflected wave coming back from the surface of the liquid. You see the that goes up, the green wave goes up, it changes phase because of the difference in density, comes back and reinforces itself in that area where we have the white, uh, which is where you part, put your part to be clean. In the next, in the other side, on the right-hand side, we've now made it a full wavelength deep. And once again, the green wave goes up, it reflects, changes phase at the top, another pressure node, and comes back down and makes another pressure node halfway down. Now, these can be a multiples of wavelengths. Tanks don't have to be a single wavelength or a quarter wavelength or whatever. Uh, and we can actually demonstrate this effect by taking a tank and changing the level and looking at what happens in those two areas using either any of uh, several techniques. Aluminum foil is the, is the, is the favorite. I'm not, a favorite. I'm not a fan of aluminum foil, but um, uh, it'll never go away. So you can actually cut a piece of aluminum foil in half in that right-hand tank, uh, and you'll cut it in half a third of the way down in the left-hand tank. And it's very this easy is, to see that dynamic change as we have evaporation in a tank. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, And that's why we use overflow weirs in some cases to, to very precisely level. establish that level to prevent or create um, this effect. Now, you can also do it side to side. Um, and in this case, we have couple of options. Number one, we can have transducers mounted on the left-hand side as shown here and then reflecting off of the uh, other side of the tank surface to give us that uh, pressure node that we're talking about. Or if you really, really, really want to get at it, you can put transducers on that side and synchronize them with the ones on the left and the two push against each other and we now get extremely uh, high intense zones like the ones we use for ophthalmic cleaning. Right. And the crazy thing is that when you do that, you hear no sound at all. All you see is the, is the ultrasonic uh, cavitation. Okay. And you can extend this. Uh, you can make pressure nodes different distances. For example, this uh, uh, we might have a lens blank, for example, in the middle there, that part being cleaned. And we have two critical surfaces. And if we space them exactly correctly, uh, we can get pressure nodes to occur uh, on those surfaces. You also have to do a little calculation to see what the speed of sound is uh, in the glass as well. But um, that's the application of something like this can be challenged by the the carrier uh, for the parts. For example, if it's on a conveyor and an application like this, 
Also, the geometry of the product is not necessarily going to be completely flat on both sides. Um, but it can still be beneficial. Right. Yeah. Okay. Amplitude effect on cavitation. Changing the ultrasonic amplitude changes the amount of energy that's available to create cavitation bubbles that grow to a large enough size to implode. You can see in the two uh, density uh, strips on the left there, if you could run them again, Josh. Sorry. Okay. On the right-hand one, you're seeing two bubbles, two voids for every one on the left. And this is simply because you have more energy able to do more things. It's kind of like uh, if you have so many, so much power uh, in your electrical line uh, and you want to run two bulbs, you have to put more power. Uh, the same thing has happened here. There is no universally accepted way to scale ultrasonic power requirements. Uh, and here are a few of the reasons. Josh, you want to go yep. that? So the first reason, um, ultrasonic power is usually expressed in uh, watts per unit volume or often customers will have specifications in their in their written specs and standards uh, specking watts per unit area. The latter of these uh, we find to be very problematic because watts per unit area um, is actually really defined by how many transducers we can place on a tank surface. Um, but probably more importantly because you can spec that base on the area of a tank and if you have a 12 inch deep tank versus a 30 inch deep tank um, with that same specification based on the XY surface available, you're gonna have very different um, ultrasonic performance within the bath. Okay, and I wanna get on the watts bit just a little bit. Go ahead, John. Uh, watts <laughs> is a rate of doing work. It's not a measure of doing work. In order to express the work accomplished, the rate of doing work must be integrated over a period of time. For example, kilowatt hours, in the case of your electric meter, you may use a thousand watts when you're, dry, when you're running your hair dryer, but you're only using two watts when you're running your nice little LED nightlight bulb. So the two are different. The total that you're gonna have depends upon how many watts you use and for how much time you use it. My best example is watts and miles per hour are like the same thing. They're both rates of doing work. And what is the meaning of saying it's 50 miles per hour from Chicago to Detroit? What does that tell you? The Never could figure that very out. Very hot button issue for John. Yeah, it is. Uh, reason number two, um, every ultrasonic manufacturer has their, most ultrasonic manufacturers have different ways of uh, expressing and interpreting ultrasonic power. Um, a couple of the terms here, you can see peak to peak, uh, half peak power, RMS, or average. Um, Blackstone ultrasonics equipment is rated using average power over time. And to John's point, without, without any mathematical shenanigans, um, you can see very, very large differences up to an order of magnitude between peak and average power. Um, so maximum power is our peak power is something that's often used in something like ultrasonic welding, where the maximum rate of energy per time is, is really measured and important over a very short uh, time duration, a few milliseconds to a few seconds. Um, and in those cases, we can be looking at six to eight times the RMS power um, for peak power. Average power, a good example is something like light bulbs, as John just highlighted. Um, and the root mean square power can actually be typically higher than average power, but could be very different depending on the um, voltage wave form. The wave, wave form, yeah. yeah. Reason number three, um, there is no very accurate method to scale ultrasonic power um, based on tank size. So based on a lot of the work that John's done here over 50 plus years at Blackstone on thousands of different projects, um, we have empirically demonstrated uh, the required effect of ultrasonic power for good cleaning in different tank sizes. Um, there are numerous companies out there which may provide different guidance. Uh, it's very common to hear something like 10 to 12 watts per liter for 
general cleaning or 20 to 25 watts per liter for aggressive cleaning. Uh, we feel that those estimates are still need to be considered relative to tank size. Um, the reason is that for larger tanks, the waves can propagate farther distances without reflection and each reflection uh, means a power loss or an energy loss in that wave. Um, and that's why um, the larger tanks don't necessarily require the higher power. Uh, the above chart is uh, one empirically derived based on uh, the kind of experience we're talking about over many years here. If you look to the left of the chart where you have something that's less than 10 gallons in the uh, tank volume, on the very small tanks like laboratory scale tanks that might be two or three gallons, it is very common to see power densities there in the range of 120 to 140 watts per gallon. However, it would be totally impractical to try to do that for a 100 gallon tank. And the, um, the ultrasonic cleaning trials will typically show that it's not necessary as well. Uh, as we get to much larger tanks, that becomes even more apparent uh, where we can see in large tank applications, we will often scale down ultrasonic power to as little as five watts per gallon. Again, it's application dependent. And it, uh, if we have a heavy duty cleaning application or a lot of contamination, we might uh, double these guidelines. Okay, cavitation density versus power. Um, you see a curve like this, uh, when you increase ultrasonic power from using amplitude control uh, from a low power to a high power. At first, you get no cavitation voids created at all. That's because there's not enough power there to do it. Uh, eventually, some start to form, and then we get this line of, of relatively uniform uh, increase in power uh, that goes up to the onset of what we call surface cavitation. And surface cavitation is where the ultrasonic transducer actually starts to separate from the liquid and all of the cavitation falls to the bottom. Um, I'm going to invite you to uh, go to that reference down there because uh, the full explanation is a little long and uh, it's worth looking up though. More power is not necessarily better when it comes to ultrasonic uh, cleaning. Uh, what really happens, as shown here, you get to the point, ultrasonic power is self-limiting. Eventually, you get so many cavitation bubbles or so many cavitation voids that they get in the way of each other and can, there can be no more. Um, and that's, uh, that's just a total waste of, of energy and, and effort to do that. Effective frequency on cavitation. Um, now here we can see that the uh, the frequency we're getting twice as many bubble twice as many bubbles on the right hand side because we have twice as many waves going by uh, than we do on the left. But you'll also see if you run it again, Josh, that the ones on the left are bigger than the ones on the right. So we're still um, conserving energy. The conservation of energy still, still forms. It's just that we have more bigger bubbles uh, at low frequency and fewer smaller bubbles, or fewer big bubbles at low frequency and more smaller bubbles at high frequency. Okay. A um, little sensitive to time here, so I'll try to push through this a little bit more uh, quickly. Uh, modes of cleaning with ultrasound, cavitation we've talked about a lot today. We earlier talked about acoustic streaming, uh, which is this sort of bulk flow that's created in a bath at higher frequencies. The third one we haven't touched on much is a micro streaming, which is um, back to the oscillation that happens with the stable cavitation voids that are created in the bath and the flow that's created around those voids as they op oscillate. Um, it's, it's largely thought that in semiconductor cleaning, wafer cleaning applications, for example, that this is the predominant mechanism that's really contributing to the cleaning process. Um, as we look at the spectrum of ultrasonic cleaning that we entertain between Ransahoff and Blackstone Ney and our, our sister company in China, we are often cleaning uh, applications where the customers are concerned about particles anywhere from 400 microns 
um, in automotive or industrial applications, uh, heavy industrial equipment. Down to in Megasonic, we talk about um, critical cleaning on nodal uh, distances of seven to 16 nanometers. We've got a rough frequency spectrum applied to this range of cleaning applications. It's not perfect, um, but as a general guideline, um, for larger particle cleaning applications, we wanna be using ultrasound in the 20 or 25 kilohertz range. And where we look at precision cleaning in semiconductor, we're up into the one to three and five megahertz range. Everything in between will often actually employ uh, multiple process steps using ultrasound where we might start with lower frequencies like 40 kilohertz and do our final rinsing in 270 kilohertz applications. Just sort of a quick example of this. Um, this shows erosion. Can I have that back? There we go. This shows erosion from a graphite part. Graphite um, erodes uh, in ultrasonic energy uh, due, to cavita due to ultrasonic cavitation. And what we're seeing here is four one-hour runs of a graphite part. Um, you can see that in the in the Top one, that's the first run. The next one is the second, the third, and the fourth. And we can see that the particle distribution is relatively uniform. Uh, these were all done at 40 kilohertz. Now, if we take the same part and run it at 120 kilohertz, look what happens. The smaller particles are the ones that come off, not the larger ones. This is just an example. Um, lower frequencies, bigger, part bigger particles, higher frequencies, smaller particles. Okay, how does an ultrasonic transducer determine frequency? Well, basically it's by length. Uh, transducer A has a half wavelength resonance. Transducer B has a half wavelength resonance. Transducer B is going to operate at a higher frequency than transducer A does. So a lot of it has to do with size. We're looking for resonance of the transducer. Okay, now, there's also a phenomenon in transducers uh, where there are several operating points that could be used. Uh, these are re different resonance modes within the transducer. Think of a violin string resonating in two modes or three modes or four modes. I'm sure you've all seen videos about that. Go ahead. Um, in an ultrasonic transducer that can create several frequencies, what we do is we utilize those nodal points uh, to, or those, those resonant points uh, to operate the ultrasonic transducer at. In this case, you can see that the two transducers are the same size, but in one case, we're driving it in a single resonance mode, where in the other side, on the right-hand side, we're driving it at double or triple um, or quadruple uh, that resonance mode. So by changing the mode of resonance, we can change the frequency that an ultrasonic transducer operates at. Just to highlight quickly again, what John was talking about with the, um, the data plots earlier, on um, different frequencies, this is not to scale, but generally showing that when we can employ a multiple frequency system, um, with those bell curves of round particle cleanup in each particle size range, uh, if we, put them together with a multi-frequency cleaning system, we can actually do a much better job of cleaning up a broad spectrum of particle sizes. I think I can skip that one. This would be good for you to discuss. All right, boundary layer thickness. There is something called the um, boundary layer, which is near the surface of a part. This is an area where um, the liquid, the clean liquid is so well connected to the part that it literally can't move, which means that it can't move uh, to make cavitation voids. The closer you are to a part, the smaller the cavitation voids must be in order to form. As you move farther away from the surface, that layer, that barrier layer, viscous, viscous barrier layer is what it's called, uh, allows us to form larger and larger cavitation uh, voids. So when we're removing small particles, we use high frequencies, 
high frequencies not only remove those small particles better, but they can get down to the part where they're actually where they, where they actually exist. Larger particles require more energy, larger voids, and therefore those work better uh, for removing larger particles. But those larger particles are further away from the surface. Uh, once again, it's worth it to look at the reference down there at the bottom. It'll tell you this whole story. You're talking about frequency selection for different um, cleaning applications. Um, there are always several considerations that are important here. Uh, type of contamination, uh, the type of particles and the particle size, um, and the types of soluble contamination that may be involved as well. Um, equally important in that selection is the substrate. Material properties of the substrate, um, especially hardness and erodibility in an ultrasonic bath um, become very critical. Stainless steel, for example, is very robust and we can clean this in 25 kilohertz. But if we're cleaning aluminum or copper or brass components, uh, those frequencies can actually cause surface damage. And the other type of damage that we risk could come from resonance itself. And that's something that we have seen historically in applications um, like hard disk drive electronic components, right. for example. Right. Um, substrate and surface finish, this can also be impacted by um, lower frequency, larger cavitation void ultrasonic application. Um, and one place that this is, is very commonly seen is in electronics. Um, for example, it was discovered years ago that 40 kilohertz, for example, might be far too aggressive for electronic component cleaning, printed circuit board applications. Uh, and now we see that in um, not only printed circuit boards, also in um, semiconductor package assembly, that 40 kilohertz may be far too aggressive and something like 132 kilohertz or above would be preferable. Okay, effects of, effect, effects of liquid properties. Um, this is something that's not, not talked about much, uh, but something that's very important and it has to do with your chemical selection. And the big driver here is temperature because temperature changes a lot of those things in the left-hand column uh, one way or the other. And that makes other things happen differently when it comes to the cavitation. Um, there's... Uh, there's a lot here uh, to look at and a lot to think about, uh, more than we can cover at this time, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a topic for another time, I think. Agreed. Uh, ultrasonic power. Uh, this is an interesting conundrum because, once again, people are pushing the ultrasonic manufacturers to provide higher and higher ultrasonic power. There gets a, to be a point where more power is not the answer uh, to making a better operating system. If you go to the next one, <clears throat> for example, and this is just one of many considerations. <clears throat> when you have an ultrasonic transducer, as shown in the top illustration there, it not only moves up and down, it also sends out shear waves through the metal around it. And those shear waves create up and down forces. Now, if we're asked to put more and more power on to crowd transducers together, for example, um, in the bottom illustration, the red transducers are working against the shear wave, which means we've totally wasted that power. That transducer is not going to add anything uh, to the motion of that, of that plate. More transducers on the radiating surface will always mean we're consuming more power, but it won't necessarily mean that we're that's right. contributing My to that. My favorite example is it's like driving a car down the road with one wheel going backwards. Uh, just doesn't really make any sense. So um, one other consideration, we sort of touched on this earlier. Within a cleaning tank, um, we have a few regions where we generally want to be careful about cleaning our components. Um, the surface is very... The region very close to the radiating surface where we mount the ultrasonic transducers can be a region of non-uniformity and high intensity. The, the liquid air interface 
can also be such a region uh, based on the potential for constructive interference that John described earlier. Um, and that's why we wanna be operating in the safe volume in the cleaning tank. And again, to echo the considerations John pointed out earlier, it may be important to make sure we disable the ultrasound <coughs> before we place parts into the tank or remove them from the tank. Multi-frequency systems. Um, Blackstone has a lot of patented technology around the uh, multi-frequency transducer systems. Um, this allows us to put a lot of um, power density into a smaller area. There are another, other ways to do this by installing uh, multiple single resonant mode transducers on a single tank surface, which we have in the top view. Here. But eventually you run out of real estate. Correct. Right. Um, we can skip this one okay. in the interest of time and hit this one, John. All right. Now, I don't know whether we have sound here or not, but remember those those peak operating points that I told you about where the transducer is resonant? Uh, you get more power at those at those points. And if you sweep the, the uh, frequency, as most systems do today, uh, the result will be that you have pulses of power. If you push your button there. Pulses of power that are equally spaced uh, due to the uh, frequency sweep. Now, one way to get rid of that is to randomize the sweep so that instead of having those peak powers coming at the same time, and the reason we don't want them to come uh, at equal intervals is because they can also excite resonance in a part which can damage it. So by sweeping the sweep, as we call it, um, it means that we can avoid that secondary resonance. Uh, as you can see, they're not randomly spaced now. Uh, the main drivers that we have for employing frequency sweep in our ultrasonic systems in order of importance are temperature, temperature effects, transducer variability, and standing waves. Um, we'll step through this pretty quickly. The temperature-driven changes is actually the biggest reason. Um, as you take a transducer operating from 5C up to 85C um, at 70 kilohertz, you actually can see a range of about 4 kilohertz of uh, resonant variability. So that's the main driver for the sweep. Um, individual transducers will have uh, unit to unit variability. The sweep functionality also helps to make sure that each of these transducers on a membrane gets to operate at its uh, ideal resonant frequency throughout the cycle, but this is a smaller portion of it. And finally, we talk about um, elimination of standing waves in the tank, but John and I agree this is a, a much lesser... Lesser issue today. Yeah. <clears throat> back when, back in 25 kilohertz days, that happened a lot. So we'd like to wrap up today with some um, challenges to conventional thoughts on the employment of uncle ultrasound uh, in cleaning uncle? process. <laughs> ultrasound <laughs> in cleaning process. He's getting crazy. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll start with this one, John. Turbulation. Uh, this is one that John and I have been talking about uh, ever since I joined Blackstone. Um, it's sort of widely been advised in the field of ultrasound that you should not have um, turbulation or high flow in a tank where you're operating with ultrasound because the flow will uh, disturb the sound field and, and limit the effectiveness of the ultrasonics. Some of the testing we've done here in the last six months indicates that that may not be as true as it was in the past. Um, this is something we've got some ongoing testing tied to. Um, but we, we have some modes of amplitude uh, modes of amplitude variation that can change that effect, we right. think. And also, we just think uh, efficiency in ultrasonic systems over the years has maybe made this less critical than it used to be as we now have systems that have very fast bath recovery times, um, as we've been able to demonstrate with some aluminum foil testing. This one's yours, John. Oh, it is. Yeah. Verification of ultrasonic performance. Um, I've been playing with this for 52 years. Uh, when I started in ultrasonics, really what we had was aluminum foil, and the Ultrasonics Industry Association was looking for a better way to quantify uh, ultrasonic performance of cleaning tanks. Unfortunately, we are still at the same position that we were 52 years ago. There is no absolute way to quantify 
uh, the amount of energy in an ultrasonic tank. The goal at that point was so that we could say that one ultrasonic cleaner was better than another. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, but what we can say is that by using almost any of the techniques that are available, hydrophones, foil, uh, little tubes with colored liquid in them, uh, ceramic rings or whatever, uh, can be used to compare performance from day to day on the same system under the same conditions. But, but don't not try to judge an ultrasonic cleaner by its performance on any one of those ways uh, to evaluate. Right. None of these serve as an absolute measure. Right. And and then the final uh, slide that we have, I think, here is to talk about, um, to further the point John was talking about, we've been partnering with a company called Onda, um, who has a very unique approach to using hydrophone technology to assess what's happening in an ultrasonic bath, whereas opposed to just having a, a simple voltage output from a transducer, um, we're they're actually taking the information and dissecting it and trying to help us understand the different uh, sound pressures within a tank and, and trying to evaluate how much direct field pressure, stable cavitation pressure and transient cavitation pressure we have. Um, and this is still relatively new technology for us. So we're really just beginning to explore how to employ this to better understand. Trying to use hydrophones is not new but the analysis of the data is where the benefit is. I believe that's almost our last slide. One more. Uh, uh, degassing. We always recommend degassing uh, an ultrasonic tank before you operate it uh, to clean parts. And uh, this video, if it plays, we will show us some degassing going on. <clears throat> There's a little sound thing over at the right hand side. Turn it down. the end of our presentation. We'll be looking to uh, Lori and the team to let us know if there are any questions. All right. Well, thank you for the helpful presentation. We have a few questions here. Remember, if you can't see the chat window, um, please refresh the stream so you can type in your questions. Uh, the first question is, how can we know if an ultrasonic supplier is actually manufacturing the equipment and is able to support it? or if we are buying from a third party? I would say the best way is to visit them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the thing is that there are, there are a lot of people out there building ultrasonic systems who do not manufacture the ultrasonic equipment itself. They buy it from other people. They buy it from us and they buy it from, there are a handful of companies in the United States that do make their own ultrasonic uh, equipment, but 
Not many. There's, there are a lot more people who are selling it than are making. There's a lot of rebranding that happens. So yeah, it's um, it would be worthwhile to try to, if it's important for your application or your requirements, it would be worthwhile to try to visit the manufacturer directly. Yeah, see if they actually do it. Okay, thank you. What is the most common failure mode of ultrasonic equipment? I've heard that ultrasonic transducers only last seven or 8,000 hours before replacement is needed. Well, that depends. Uh, it depends how you use it. Uh, I've seen many ultrasonic transducers that are out there that have been operating for 25 and 30 years uh, and still are just fine. I've seen other ones that have been out there for that 7,000 hours in their trash. Um, if you use, it, it really depends on how you use it. Um, if, for example, you use extremely high temperature or extremely high caustic solutions, um, this takes a toll. And what happens is that the uh, we get pitting corrosion on the surface of the transducer and eventually it perforates. Um, but this can be mitigated by using some uh, some advanced materials today, uh, and I'm, I, I don't believe the 7,000-hour uh, rule uh, exists at this point. But like I said, uh, treat them well, and they'll treat you well. It's also in the design of the transducer. Um, you know, we talked a lot about overpacking uh, transducers onto a radiating surface. Um, in those applications, the radiating surface almost behaves more like a piston, we believe, and we actually see a much higher level of surface erosion much more quickly. So yeah. um, I, I think the important thing there is to, uh, if a customer has written specs on ultrasonic power density, to be willing to review those with the ultrasound manufacturer before, before building the system. Right. Okay. Do I have to have an automated system or, a, or are manual systems available? Yeah, you can go as high or as low as you want. I mean, we sell uh, individual tanks uh, and we sell systems that are uh, capable of you throw a part in and it goes all the way through and comes out the other end all by itself. Um, and it's a matter of money. How much money do you have and how much production do you have? Uh, but you can buy simple single tanks that will do the job if you want to manually do it. What we would typically say, though, is for very high precision cleaning applications, the more you can remove the operator variability from the process and allow the um, full process to run under machine control will typically contribute to much better particle cleanliness. Okay. This one says, we use a plastic grid in our basket to avoid scratching delicate parts. What alternatives or design for holders can you recommend? I would... First, look to an application like ETFE or ECTFE coding. Um, I think the common names for those would be either Teflon or Halar. Um, those coatings are fluoropolymer coatings, which can be applied to a basket in a very thin layer. I think typically we see 10 to 20 thousandths of an inch coating. Um, the coatings themselves are very uh, relatively hard. They don't absorb ultrasonic energy the way a plastic shield will do. Um, and like... To John's point earlier, uh, things like a plastisol coating, which are maybe a millimeter thick coating right. um, of a rubber material, that's going to absorb a lot of energy. Did I hear a half inch thick? Is that what? Um, I don't see that okay. on the question. You mean no? Yeah. Okay. Some people use you know like really really thick. Stuff. The thinner you can get, the better. If you can get like a a net, a plastic net would be better than. Uh, a square grid, for example, Absolutely. a half inch thick. Okay. So how do I prevent cavitation pitting or burning? Um, it depends on whether you're talking about the transducer or the parts. And I'm thinking that the, the question is probably about parts. Um, it's related to frequency. And cavitation pitting or burning or starring or one of the several things that it's called uh, usually happens on uh, chrome plated or aluminum, uh, anodized aluminum surfaces. The secret here is power and frequency. Higher frequencies will uh, create less cavitation uh, damage, if you want to call it damage. 
uh, then lower frequencies will, and of course, lower powers. And this can also be a chemical effect as well. A lot of times the chemical uh, uh, participates in, in the problem. Once you get a small pit started, the chemical goes goes after what's underneath and you and you grow larger pits yeah if you look take an example of like a highly polished aluminum component it it's relatively easy to demonstrate um surface finish changes on those parts even with 40 kilohertz oh, with they're magnified. yeah with, a really shiny part it really shows right. um on the softer materials if the question is about the transducer face itself um i think that goes back to what john and i talked about um, not having more power than is required in the application. Um, if you have adjustable power generators on your, your tanks, trying to validate your cleanliness results at a lower power should help to prolong your transducer life as well. Okay, so back to the question about the plastic grid. Uh, they added for cleaning, say, one micron particles. How do, how do I assess when they are all removed? Wow. <laughs> I mean, the typical method that we most commonly see employed for assessing particles in that size range is going to be um, liquid particle count testing. Yeah. Um, so you're actually extracting the part with a liquid and then running that liquid through a, a laser right. particle counting system. Or an electron I, microscope. Or an electron microscope. Uh, I actually have a lot of personal... Um, doubts about the effectiveness of uh, liquid particle count measurement, laser particle counting systems, um, in terms of assessing individual parts. I think it's more effective for assessing bath quality, but doing so with uh, individual parts is problematic because you're transferring liquid from one vessel to right. another over the right. part. Right, and even in the best, even in the highest class clean room, um, how many million particles is it? Yeah, there's something like, I think, 100,000 particles per yeah. cubic meter. That are over a micron minute, yeah. anyway. So uh, Microns are very small things. Mm -hmm. But what we would say on that point is we are never able to demonstrate effective micron-sized particle cleaning without employing multi-frequency ultrasonics. Um, as the charts in John's part of the presentation earlier, when we start to see, um, start to look at 120 kilohertz, we see a very big improvement in cleanup in the zero to five micron particle range. Well, the other thing is that um, cleaning in that range is a religion. It's not something that you put a, ma a machine in there and it magically gives you that cleanliness. Right. You have to be in the environment with the procedures and the precautions uh, to make that work. Uh, and we've, we've passed the point of the machine now, and we've gotten into a regimen uh, that you have to have a culture about. Uh, one micron size particle cleaning is a culture. It's not something you can relegate. Yeah, the process discipline, I agree with John, is um, every bit as important as the cleaning technology you're employing at that point. Okay. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have for this webinar. We hope you found it helpful. Now on behalf of the Parts Cleaning Conference and our sponsor, Blackstone Nay Ultrasonics, thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day.